Na? So, we will continue our discussion of countable and uncountable sets. So, let us quickly recall that in the last class we proved a few things about countable sets, namely that uh, first of all a subset of a countable set is countable, then uh, union of a countable family of countable sets is countable and a finite product of countable sets is countable. And using that we also saw that some of the familiar sets like the set of all integers is countable, okay. set of all rational numbers is countable. So, now let us proceed with that. I uh, will now introduce one more uh, notation. Uh, let us say we have two sets A and B. Okay. Then we shall denote this, let us say this is read as A is dominated by B. Okay. A is dominated by B or if this means there exists F from A to B and F is injective. Injective means as you know 1 1. Injective. Okay. F may or may not be on to. Okay. F may or may not be on to. Okay. <coughs> of course, if F is on to also, then then we know that this means A is numerically equivalent to B. Okay. So, what it you can interpret this as uh, number of elements in A is less than or equal to number of elements in B. Okay. That is the rough that is roughly the meaning. Now, what can we say about this relation, the properties of this relations? First of all, we can say this for A. Obviously, A is dominated by A. You can take F as an identity function. Okay. Then second thing we can say is that if let us say if A is dominated by B and let us say B is dominated by C, then that A is dominated by C. Okay. That is also clear. Okay. So, if F is a function going from A to B which is 1 1 and if G is a function going from B to C which is also 1 1, just consider G composed with F that will be a function from A to C it is also be 1 1. So, that is clear. Okay. Right. Uh, third property is this, if A is dominated by B and B is also dominated by A, then yes, if somebody said something, then what can I say about A and B? A, A is equal to B. Right, that is then A is numerically equivalent to B. A is numerically equivalent to B. Okay. <coughs> but this last thing is not obvious. Okay. So, what it means is that suppose you have injective function going from A to B and similarly an injective function going from B to A, those two functions will not be the same. Okay. Then there exists a bijective function from A to B. Okay. Now, that is something that is not obvious at all okay. and in fact that is a very well known theorem in set theory. It is a very famous theorem, it is known as schroeder burstein theorem. schroeder burstein theorem. And what schroeder burstein theorem says is just what I said just now. If you, if you take two sets A and B and if there is a 1 1 function from A to B and if there is a 1 1 function from B to A, okay, then there exists a 1 1 and on 2 function from A to B. That is schroeder burstein theorem. Okay. Uh, the proof of this is somewhat lengthy, so we shall not discuss that here. I mean those of you who are interested, you can see a, a proof of it in Siemens book. I mentioned Siemens. Siemens book right in the beginning. Okay. It is it is given there. There is one more uh, source in which you can find a fairly good proof of this. Uh, perhaps many of you have heard of uh, Professor S. Kumaresan. Okay, quite famous for this MTTS program. Some of you may have attended that also. Okay, so uh, he is a professor in uh, University of Hyderabad, Mathematics Department, University of Hyderabad. You look at his home page. Okay, in University of Hyderabad and that home page contains some popular articles okay. and one of those articles is a proof of schroeder burstein theorem. Okay. Okay. You can find it there or also there is an MTTS home page which also contains some popular mathematics articles, there also uh, you can find this proof. Okay. 
all right uh, <coughs> now uh, let us again go to one another famous theorem in this yeah by the way can you see that these three relationship issues look uh, these three properties of this relation they look something like a, they, this is not an equivalence relation okay but this is something like a partial order okay again not exactly a partial order because in partial order we would have required it if this happens then we should have had a equal to b okay so it is not a equal to b we 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 have only got a is numerically equivalent to b but what we can say is that if it is a partial order see suppose you look at this equivalence relation among the family of all sets okay then that equivalence relation will split uh, will partition the family of sets into equivalence classes okay and uh, what are what are the members of equivalence classes those are the members which are numerically equivalent to each other okay, right so suppose you take the set of all that class all those classes okay then on that class this is a partial order okay because then then the equivalence class containing this what this says is that equivalence class containing a it's same as equivalence class containing b okay right. okay then <coughs> let's go a little further so far we have not seen any example of an uncountable set you know. uh, to do that uh, okay let us again go to a famous theorem it is known as the cantor's theorem and this theorem says the following let a be any set okay. a be any set then consider the power set of a okay. that is the set of all subsets of a okay. then first of all mm, a is dominated by this power set of a we shall use this notation 2 power a I have mentioned earlier that 2 power a or script p of a these two notations are very commonly used for the set of all subsets of a let us use this okay and it is not equivalent okay that second part is more important okay. first part is more or less trivial okay what does it mean in terms of functions or definition it means there exists a 1 1 function going from a to power set of a okay but there is no bijection okay there is no bijection between these two sets okay so let us go to the proof okay okay now first of all is it clear to you that this whole thing is trivial if a is an empty set okay right if a is an empty set its power set will contain just one element and the set itself contains no element okay so there can be no no bijection between the two and the 1 1 function will be a trivial function so that case let us forget about it okay so if a is empty it is trivial okay nothing to be proved okay so assume a is non empty so in the first part we need to show that there exists an injective function from a to its power set that is given any element let us say x in a okay we, we want to construct a function that is f going from its so suppose we take x in a this x f of x should be some subset of a okay f of x should be some subset of a now can you see that there is a very obvious choice for this take the singleton set containing the element x okay right that is the most obvious function that one can think of okay so define f of x as singleton x so this is a function from a to its power set that function is 1 1 right that is clear okay so f is 1 1 this part is proved okay so this part is proved right okay now we will look at this now here what is it that we have to prove that a is not numerically equivalent that means there cannot exist any bijection between these two sets okay right so so the way to proceed is fairly straightforward uh, that is assume that there exists a bijection and get a contradiction okay right so suppose suppose g from a to its power set of a is a bijection 
in fact we can show that there cannot exist any onto function from a to its power set of a but that's okay I mean. okay all right now we will construct by the way this proof is also given original proof is also given by cantor okay. cantor is a famous very famous german mathematician who has done several things in analysis and set theory. Okay. You will hear this name again and again. By the way, Schrauder and Burstein, these two are also famous uh, German mathematicians. Okay. So, suppose this is an onto function. I will think of a set B as follows. Okay. Uh, define B. Uh, it is set of all x in A such that x does not belong to g x. Okay. Remember g x is a subset of a, okay. x is a function from sorry g is a function from a to its power set. So, every x in a g of x is a subset of a, okay, right. So, x so given any x, x may or may not belong to g x, right. So, you pick up those x for which x does not belong to g x. I am not saying anything about whether this set is empty or not or whether such an x exists or not, okay, whatever is that. Okay. So, take all those x for which x does not belong to g x, you call that set B. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Now, this g is a bijection, right. g is a bijection and this B is a subset of A. right? So, what follows from that? There must exist some element in A such that g of that element is this. Okay. Okay. So, we can say that uh, since in fact for this all that we require is g is on to okay. since g is on to I will say there exists suppose I call that element small b there exists small b in A such that g of this small b is equal to b. Okay. That is fine. Now, we ask a question, what can we say about this element B? Okay. Does this element B belongs to B? Of course, B is a subset of A and B belongs to A. So, B has to be either in B or outside B. Okay. All right. Let us say what happens, suppose, suppose B belongs to B. That means what? <coughs> this implies B does not belong to G of B or G of B, right? B does not belong to G of B. But what is G of B? Okay. So look at this. What if so what you have seen is if B belongs to B, then B does not belong to B. That is a contradiction. Okay, that is a contradiction. Okay. Right, okay. What is the other possibility? Suppose B, B, suppose B does not belong to B. Okay. Suppose B does not belong to B, but that will give that B belongs to B because that is how. Okay. On the other hand, that is on the other hand, if small b does not belong to B, which is nothing but G of B. Then the way in which we have defined B, it means so B must belong to B, small b must belong to B. Okay. Then small b must belong to B. Okay. That means B belongs to small b belongs to B and small b does not belong to B, both are leading to contradiction. Okay. Right. Such a thing cannot happen, right? B is an element of A and small b is an element of A, big B is a subset of A. So, small b has to be either inside b or outside b okay. and we are here we are saying that both the statements are leading to a contradiction right. And again what is the source of this contradiction? This we assume that there exists a bijection. Okay. So, that must be false. Okay. So, this is a contradiction. Okay. Okay. So, this completes the proof. Is this clear? Okay, this is Cantor's original proof of this theorem. <coughs> so, let me again come back to the statement of theorem. 
that given any set A, of course, this is trivial part, okay. A is dominated by its power set, but A is not numerically equivalent to the power set of it. So, A and its power set are there can be no bijection between any set A and its power set. Okay. Does it immediately give us an example of an uncountable set? Does this theorem immediately, yes? What is that to do with this theorem? Right, that is right. That is, suppose we take A as the set of all natural numbers. Suppose I take A as the set of all natural numbers, then n and 2 power n, there can be no bijection, right. There can be no bijection, and it means that 2 power n is an uncountable set, right. Okay. So, this immediately gives that uh, 2 power n is an uncountable set. So, we have got an example of an uncountable set. Okay. In fact, it can be shown that this 2 power n is actually numerically equivalent to real numbers. Okay. This 2 power n is actually numerically equivalent to real numbers. Okay. Uh, let me give you some idea about this, okay. how, how one shows that. I uh, will just give you some steps in this, may not be the whole thing. Uh, you have heard of this term binary sequence. It is a sequence whose terms are 0 and 1. <coughs> sequence is what uh, we have seen the sequence is a function from the set of all natural numbers. Okay. So, any sequence whose terms are just 0 and 1, those are called binary sequences. Okay. On the so what I want to say is that suppose you take the set of all binary sequences, okay? Suppose we take the set of all binary sequences, then that set is uncountable. Okay? So set of all binary sequences is uncountable. Of course, there are several ways of saying this, but one way of saying that is that we can say that this set is nothing but this set. Okay, this set is nothing but this set. Okay? Set of all binary sequences, nothing but in the sense it is numerically equivalent. Okay, and okay, let us give some name to this. Okay, suppose suppose I call X is the set of all binary sequences. Let X denote the set of all binary sequences. We want to say X is uncountable. So, I want to say this, I okay. will write this as a claim, claim means this is something that I want to show, claim is x is numerically equivalent to 2 power n. Okay. Okay. Mm. I will take uh, I will take a map from here to here. So, so consider f from 2 power n to x. That is given a subset of n, given a subset of n, I want to construct a binary sequence. Okay. I want to construct a binary sequence. So, so let A be a subset of n. Okay, and define f of a. Define f of a. You have all heard of what is meant by a characteristic function of a set. Of a set, right? Okay. So, f of a, I define it as a characteristic function of a. Okay. What does this mean? That if it is if it is 1 
if an if a number belongs to a okay that is remember uh, this let me repeat this okay this chi of x a of some natural number right it's a function uh, see uh, <coughs> it's a function from n to n it's a because it's a sequence so it's a function from n and not n to n n to the set 0 1 okay n to the set binary set okay so we'll define correct n is equal to 1 if n belongs to a and 0 otherwise that is 0 if m does not belong to a For example, if A is a set of all even numbers, then the corresponding sequence is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, etcetera. Okay. Similarly, we can see. Okay. So, is it clear that this characteristic function is basically a binary sequence? Okay. Characteristic function is a function, okay. It is a function going from n to so each characteristic function is a function going from n to this set 0 and 1 its values are 0 and 1 okay so it's a binary sequence okay All right. is this function 1 1 that is that is given a subset let us say if there are uh, if the characteristic functions of two sets coincide okay right that is when when do we say that something is 1 1 suppose f of a is equal to f of b okay that is same as saying that the characteristic functions coincide okay will it imply that a is equal to b right that is clear okay is it on to that means given a binary sequence given a binary sequence can we construct a subset of n whose characteristic function is the given binary sequence that is again clear okay you take those n for which uh, that uh, that is you look at those uh, those n for which the value of the sequence is 1 collect those n and take that as a set a okay take that as a set a that will be a subset of n okay right so this map which takes a to its characteristic function is is a bisection so f is a bisection that proves this right. So, f is a bisection and we already seen that this is an uncountable set. So, x is an uncountable set okay. We can also uh, see one more proof of this that the set of all binary sequences is uncountable um, or that is again a, uh, see I will discuss this because it is also one of the well known methods of doing that something is uncountable okay. That is if, if a set is countable we already know that it is infinite then you can arrange its elements in the form of a sequence okay right right so suppose suppose x is countable suppose x is countable then we can write then we can write x sides x sides uh, x1 x2 etc Remember, each of this x1, x2 is a sequence, right? Each of this x1, x2, etc. is a sequence, okay? So, let us have some rotation for this. For example, what is the sequence x1? The sequence x1 is, I will denote it by x1 as uh, say x11, x12, x13, etc., okay? Right? See, so, remember, each of this x11, x12, either 0 or 1, okay? each of these elements etc are either 0 or 1 okay. So, similarly, so let us say ith sequence x i, I can denote it as x i 1, x i 2 etc okay. And to show that this set is, suppose this were the case, it will mean that you can list all binary sequences in this fashion okay. And what we want to show is that that cannot be done okay. Okay. So, suppose I construct a sequence 
which is different from all these, okay, then it will mean that x is not countable, right? Okay, all right. Now define binary sequence x as follows, okay. Binary sequence x oh, as follows. Mm. Okay, I'll use some other notation because x one x. So I'll call that sequence y. Define the binary sequence y as follows. Mm. Y is equal to y one, y two, etc. Okay. And I should say what is y1, what is y2, okay. what is y1, what is y2, etc. Okay. What I say is as follows, take y1, you look at x11, okay. if x11 is 0, you take y1 as 1 and if it is 1, you take y1 as 0, okay. right. so take y1 as 1 if x11 is 0 and 0 if x 1 1 is equal to 1. Okay. Similarly, you take y 2 same way, look at this x 2 2, second sequence x 2, second sequence x 2, x 2 1, x 2 2 etcetera, look at this uh, entry x 2 2 here, if x 2 2 is 1, you take y 2 as 0, if it is 0, you take y etcetera as 1. So, you take y 2 as 1, if x 2 2 is 0 and 0 if x 2 2 is equal to 1. Okay. And now it is clear how to go over it, proceed in this way, take the general uh, entry y n as follows, y n is equal to 1 if x n n is 0, that is x n n will be somewhere here, oh, suppose this is uh, x n maybe x n n and 0 if x n n is equal to 1. Okay. Then y is a binary sequence, okay. y is a binary sequence, okay. but since y if y is a binary sequence it must be one of these x 1, x 2, x n, okay. right. but you can see that it cannot be x 1 because y 1 is different from x 1 1, it cannot be x 2 because y 2 is different from x 2 2. Okay. It cannot be x n because y n is different from x n. So, y cannot be any of these and still it is a binary sequence. Okay. Right. So, this is a contradiction and this contradiction we have got because of what? Because we assume that x is countable and wrote the elements of x in this form x 1, x 2, etc. Okay. That cannot be done. Okay. This is also a fairly standard technique of proving that a set is not countable okay. and this method is uh, known as uh, diagonal method, the diagonal method of proof. And you can see the reason why it is called diagonal method, okay. that is you are arranging the elements in something like in the form of a matrix and looking at the diagonal entries okay. and then constructing a new sequence which differs from each of the diagonal entries, okay. that is why it is called diagonal method or diagonal process. Okay. Is this clear? Now, you all know that uh, every real number has a decimal expansion, can be expressed in terms of its decimal expansion. Right? You also know that it can also be expressed using binary expansion. Right? Decimal expansion is just one choice, okay? it can also express by using binary numbers just 0 and 1. Okay? So, so, what you can say is that this set of all binary sequences is nothing but the set of all real numbers. You take any real number and take its binary expansion, that is a binary sequence, right. So, for each binary, so each real number you can associate a binary sequence, which is nothing but its binary expansion, right. And similarly, if you give, are given any binary uh, uh, sequence, you can associate a real number with that, okay. Only problem is that uh, which of the entries you take as an integer part and you which of this you take as a fractional part, etc., that will be a problem to decide with. But let us say we take only those numbers lying between 0 and 1. Okay. Let us just take the numbers lying between 0 and 1. Okay. Right. 
then this problem will not be there. There is there is no integer part. Okay, so you can say that all. So suppose you are given any binary sequence like that. Okay, you let us say some sequence one zero one. You can take that number as zero point one zero one zero etc. That is the binary expansion of the given number. So in other words, this sequence x you can say that it is numerically equivalent to x. Okay, this sequence x is a numerically equivalent to x. So what does that prove? That the interval 0, 1 is uncountable. Okay. It is it is numerically equivalent to the set of all binary sequences, which we have already showed to be uncountable. So that is uh, uncountable. Okay. All right. Now we have proved in the last class that a subset of a countable set is countable. Okay. Does it also follow from that immediately that if if A is a set and if it has an uncountable subset, then the A itself must be uncountable? Suppose a set contains an uncountable subset, then the whole set itself must be uncountable, right? It is basically the same. It's basically the same statement, said in a different, different uh, method, okay? different language. Okay? So now, if this is uncountable, that will mean that R is uncountable. Okay, this uncountable. It means that R is also uncountable. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, you can show something more. Okay, if if we were simply to say that R is uncountable, then this is enough. Okay, pick up some subset that is uncountable. Once show that. Okay, but we can say something more. Okay, it is the following. Okay, I'll give that you as an exercise. You take any open interval of R. Okay, then you can show that that open interval is numerically equivalent to the whole of R. Okay, that is in particular. I will just give you this to you as an exercise. Okay, show that. And if you can do this for this interval, you can do it for any interval. Okay, show that. What does it mean? That show that there exists a bijection from the open interval zero to one to the whole whole of R. Okay, An elementary exercise. Try to try to find such a function on your own. Okay, and once you can do this, you can show that there is nothing particular about zero and one. Okay, you can take any open interval. And that any open interval is numerically equivalent to R, and in particular, any two open intervals are numerically equivalent to each other. Okay, right? Okay. But once you show this, it will it will mean that R is numerically equivalent to two power n. That's clear, right? We already shown that this is numerically equivalent to x, and x is numeric uh, equal to two power n. And this is numerically equivalent to R. So comparing all this, you can say that R is numerically equivalent to the power set of n. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I'll just make a few comments about what are known as uh, cardinal numbers, and then we shall close this discussion about the countable, uncountable sets, etc. Okay. Um, cardinal numbers. I think I have mentioned it earlier also. Um, if A is a finite set, let us take set. If A is a finite set, cardinal by the cardinal number is nothing but a symbol which we associate with every set. Okay. We call it the cardinal number of that set. Okay. We call it the cardinal number of that set. So suppose A is a set. Uh, uh, let us say uh, suppose A is a finite set. We shall say cardinal number of A is zero if A is empty. Okay, right? And this is equal to n. This is equal to n if if A is numerically equivalent to this J suffix n. Okay, we have said that A is finite. Okay. We have said that A is finite. That means A is either empty or A is numerically equivalent. Remember. Remember what, what was J suffix n? It was this set 1, 2, 3, etc. up to n. Segment consisting of first natural numbers. Okay. In other words, this n cardinal number of at for finite set is nothing but the number of elements in that set. Okay. It's nothing but the number of elements in that set. Okay. Then cardinal number of this set of all natural numbers. Okay that is denoted by this symbol it is called aleph naught 
it is it is read as alef not okay alef suffix 0 okay alef not okay and then cardinal number associated with this set okay with any of these sets okay r uh, 0 1 or 2 power n etc whatever i will just take this set 2 power n that is usually taken as the symbol small c okay, okay. and that is called cardinality of the continuum it is called cardinality of the continuum Now, if you take uh, various cardinal numbers, then we define a relationship between them. So, suppose uh, suppose A and B are cardinal numbers. Okay. Of course, one thing is clear: A equal to B will happen in which case? A equal to B means oh, oh, those are associated with two sets which are numerically equivalent to each other. Okay. That is A equal to B means let, let us write it in full form. It means there exists sets A and B such that cardinal cardinality of A is small a, cardinality of B is small b and a is numerically equivalent to b. Okay. So, if the two sets are numerically equivalent, the cardinal number associated with them is the same. Okay. Okay. Let us now also see what is the meaning of this a less than or equal to b. Okay. Again, it means that uh, there exists sets A, B such that cardinality of A is small a, cardinality of B is small b and A is dominated by B. Okay. That means, there exists sets A and B such and an injective function f going from A to B which is 1 1. Okay and corresponding numbers are small a and small b. Okay. And similarly, one will also like to define what is meant by a strictly less than b. Okay. Okay. This again as usual, we will say that a is less than or equal to b and a not equal to b. In terms of sets, what does it mean? It means that there exist sets A and B such that cardinality of big A is small a, cardinality of big B is small b and A is dominated by B, but not numerically equivalent to B. Okay. And in fact, there exist no two sets with this property which are numerically equivalent to each other. Okay. That is the meaning of saying that A is strictly less than B. Okay. All right. Now, if you look at the set of all uh, cardinal numbers. Uh, can you see that this is now a partial order? For example, we can see this property that is A is of course, A is less than or equal to A that is clear. Okay. A is less than or equal to A. Okay. Then second thing is that A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C that implies A is equal to C. Okay. And lastly, A is less than or equal to B and b is less than or equal to a. Now, this time I can say this implies a is equal to b. Okay. And then this last thing follows from the schroeder bursty's theorem. Okay. Okay. Because a is less than or equal to b and b is less than or equal to a means what? That means, there exists two sets this a and b satisfying this property that cardinality of a is small a, cardinality of b is small b and a is dominated by b and b is also dominated by a 
then in view of stoddard bursty's theorem a and b must be numerically equivalent which is same as saying that small a is equal to small b okay so now among the set of all cardinal numbers this relation less than or equal to is a partial order okay this relation is a partial order in in those numbers okay now let us take uh, one more definition in this suppose a is a cardinal number okay cardinal number a this is called infinite cardinal infinite cardinal okay infinite cardinal if this number alef not is less than or equal to a okay it's called infinite cardinal okay okay now coming back to this relationship uh, okay for example uh, alef not itself is an infinite cardinal c is an infinite cardinal any number bigger than or equal to c is also any cardinal number bigger than or equal to c is also infinite cardinal okay one more thing that one should notice here is that in view of cantor's theorem okay for any cardinal number a a is less than 2 power a okay and what is meant by 2 power a if if this number a is associated with a set a if cardinal number of a then 2 power a is the cardinality of the power set of a 2 power a is the cardinality of the power set of a because that is what follows from the various definitions that we have seen so far okay all right now we can see uh, the relationship between whatever the cardinal numbers that we have seen so if you try to arrange all of them in certain particular order so the smallest cardinal number is of course zero okay then zero that is less than or equal to 1 that is less than or equal to 2 etc okay and this is less than or equal to n okay that takes into account all finite cardinal numbers those are same as the zero and other natural numbers okay then all these finite cardinal numbers those are strictly less than alef dot okay okay what it means that given any finite set you can have an injective map going from that set to n but no onto map okay there is no bijection okay so that is the same as saying all these finite cardinals are strictly less than alef not okay all right and then what by what you observed there alef not is strictly less than 2 power alef not okay right but 2 power alef not is same as c that is what we have okay that is what we have seen here okay r is numerically equal to 2 power n cardinal number associated with n is alef not that associated with r is cardinal continuum so which is same as saying that this 2 power alef not is same as c right okay then c will be again strictly less than 2 power c what is 2 power c it is you take the set of all subsets of r okay and whatever the cardinal number you will associate with that that will be 2 power c okay and similarly you can go on okay so 2 power c will be less than 2 power c sorry 2 power 2 power c etc okay then that will be less than 2 power 2 power 2 power c that way you can go on okay okay now this leads to one very natural question okay okay now this is fine a left not is less than 2 uh, less than 2 power c that is okay c is less than 2 power c that's also fine the question is do there exist any cardinal numbers lying between these two okay do there exist any cardinal numbers lying between these two okay for example between alef not and c and between c and 2 power c okay so let me make that question precise okay that is uh, of course that question is trivial if you take here okay if it's a finite cardinal 
then you can easily find the numbers lying between n and 2 power n. Okay. If it is a finite cardinal, that is you can easily find the numbers lying between n and 2 power n. Okay. That is trivial, okay. but it is not clear about the infinite cardinals. Okay. So, let me just say that let A be an infinite cardinal, an infinite cardinal. Does there exist? Does there exist a cardinal number b? Such that a is strictly less than b and b is strictly less than 2 power a. Okay. Of course, this is a question. In fact, it will be easier to understand this question if you uh, formulate it in terms of sets. Okay. Suppose you are given an infinite set. Okay. We have shown that every infinite set contains a countably infinite subset. Okay. So, the cardinality of an infinite set will be bigger than or bigger than or equal to alpha L f naught. So, if you take any infinite sets, its cardinal number will be an infinite cardinal. Okay. So, suppose you take any infinite set and you take its power set, okay, right. then cardinality of that set will be a, cardinality of the power set is 2 to the power a. So, asking whether there exists a b with this property means you are an infinite set and its power set, okay. can you find a subset which is bigger than given, which is bigger than or equal to the given set, okay. that means this. Okay. Can you find a b such that a is dominated by b, but not equivalent to b and b is dominated by 2 power a, but not equivalent to 2 power a. Okay. That is what it means in terms of set theory okay. and as such nobody knows the answer to this question till now. Okay. This, is a, this is an open question in set theory, the answer is not known. Okay. And there, there are certain special cases of this, they have some very special name. One of them is called continuum hypothesis. It is called continuum hypothesis. Continuum hypothesis assumes negative answer for this when A is alpha naught. Okay. In other words, continuum hypothesis says that there is no cardinal lying between alpha naught and C. Okay. Or in terms of set, there is no set which is strictly bigger than uh, set of all natural numbers and strictly less than set of all real numbers. Okay that is continuum hypothesis okay. and similarly there is another thing which is called generalized continuum hypothesis okay. it is oh let me simply say generalized continuum hypothesis okay. generalized continuum hypothesis says the answer to be no for this whole question okay answer to be no for this question okay and what is known about this continuum hypothesis is that Using the other axioms, standard axioms of the set theory, you cannot prove or disprove continuum hypothesis. Okay. Now, this is something you may be find it uh, difficult to understand, that is it more to do with logic. Okay. What it means is that uh, if you assume that continuum hypothesis is true, okay, that is quite consistent with all other axioms of set theory. Okay, and you can develop certain kind of set theory assuming that continuum hypothesis is true. Okay. At the same time, if you assume that the continuum hypothesis is false, then that is also consistent with all the other axioms of the set theory and you can develop some other kind of model of set theory assuming all other axioms and assuming that continuum hypothesis is false. Okay. Now, this is expressed by saying that the continuum hypothesis is independent of all the other axioms of set theory. That is using other axioms of set theory, you cannot prove or disprove continuum hypothesis. Okay, right? That is the that so that is the answer known about this continuum hypothesis. Okay. But even that is not known about this generalized continuum. Whether even even whether that is the case or not is not known about this generalized continuum hypothesis. Okay, all right. So with this, I will close this discussion of countable, uncountable, and finite sets for the time being. From the next class, we'll go to the next topic. Okay.